about it. Um, when we do this, when we open our Bibles to John chapter 9, and uh, that's where we're going to be. We first started uh, a couple months ago this series of absolute authority, checking out the miracles of Jesus. I said that we would go start in Matthew, we'd find a miracle, we'd park there, we'd talk about it, we'd glean something from it. And, uh, and then what we would do is uh, we'd go straight through the Gospels. And I'm not going to repeat a miracle, so if I get to the next one and it's already been spoken of, we won't talk about it. Some of these miracles are uh, told uh, several times. Once in Matthew, maybe again in Mark, maybe again in Luke, or maybe John. So this is where we're at now. Um, the next available miracle that we haven't spoken of yet is in John chapter 9. And so we're in John chapter 9. We're going to read uh, quite a few verses tonight, a little bit more than normal. We're going to read uh, 1 through 34. Uh, and the page number should be up on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, you can go ahead and use any of the uh, orange and yellow ones here at the church. And if you need one to take home, please put your name in it and take it home with you. All right. Um, this is um, what I want to do first before I read that section of scripture. I want to tell you uh, that there's a verse that I've read many times. My heart is wrapped up in this verse. It's one of my favorite in scripture. And it is, uh, my desire is to see that everybody gets saved. I hope I'm not alone in that. Um, and so one of my favorite verses of scripture, I've read it too many times, it's 1 Timothy 2.4. And it says that God wants everyone saved. Kind of clear, right? So that's cool. Uh, the gospel is available and open to anybody. Uh, but the second part of the, the verse, I don't usually stress, but for tonight I'll stress it. And it says that God wants everyone saved and to understand the truth. Okay? Jesus himself in the gospel, John says, I am the way, the truth and the life no one gets to the Father except through me. So if, if God says I want you to be saved but also to understand the truth that Jesus is the truth and so God wants you to know who? Him. He wants you to know Him. Okay? He wants you to know Him and He wants you to know Him well. Colossians 3.10 says uh, that we should, God wants us to learn to know your Creator. He wants you to know Him and to become like him. So the great commandment is wrapped up in that too. Because uh, to, to love God, you have to know who he is first. You have to know who you're loving. And then to love other people, right? To love other people, you have to be like him. That's true love display is to be like God, okay? So that's wrapped up in that too. So here's the thing. We need to know this God. You need to know this God, okay? Because if you don't know God well, if you don't lay a foundation of truth, then you get way off course, okay? If I was to draw a circle up there on the screen, and that circle represents 360 degrees, you get me? You got me? 360 degrees, okay? So each little tick, one little tick, doesn't seem that big of a deal, does it? But let me just share something. I found this online. I thought it was kind of interesting. I'd like to share this with you. Um, if you just get off one tick on the 360 mark, okay, one tick, uh, after a mile, you'll be off by 92.2 feet. One degree is starting to make a big difference. Okay, let's go on. A after traveling from San Francisco to Los Angeles, so not that big of a trip, it's in one state. Uh, from going from San Francisco to LA off one tick, you'd be off by six miles. That's a long ways, right? Uh, let's keep going. If you were traveling, you were tra trying to get from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. You see the map? Do you see it? Do you see it? Okay. If you're going from San Francisco to Washington, D.C., you'd end up on the other side of Baltimore, some 42 and a half miles away. So you'd be way off, wouldn't you? Here's, here's a good one. Uh, if you were traveling around the globe, straight around the globe, you're in Washington, D.C., and you were going to go straight around the globe, but if you went one tick off, you'd miss... Washington, D.C. by 435 miles, and you'd end up in Boston, so that's kind of cool, actually. Yeah, not really. It's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, in a rocket going to the moon, you'd be 4,169 miles off, nearly twice the diameter of the moon if you went off one tick. Okay, so my point is this. Don't, you, you, you don't want to get off one tick. You want to be dead on it. You need to know Jesus well so you can worship him well. And, and if you want you to understand the truth, you've got to carefully study the scriptures. Uh, if we're going to know the Creator and be like Him, you need to know what to be like. Okay, you can't just have some some conjured up, made up, believe what hearsay Jesus that you're trying to follow and emulate. So, what the Bible wants us to do is to understand who He truly, truly is. Okay, so we're going to read 
John chapter 9, we're going to start in verse uh, 1. Are you guys with me? Yep. Just. Ready to roll? Yep. John 9, 1. Long read. Let me uh, take a little swig here so we can be ready What to are roll. you swigging on? A little swig. You got it. Alright, here we go. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming. And then, no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And you see the meaning is sent. Siloam is sent. So the man went and washed and came back, seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? And some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. They asked, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go, uh, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. The Pharisees, the religious Jewish leaders, okay, that knew the Old Testament like the back of their hand. They took him, verse 14, because it was on the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. The Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told them, he put the mud over my eyes, and when I washed it away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus is not from God, for he was working on the Sabbath. Others said, but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, what's your opinion about this man who healed you? The man replied, I think he must be a prophet. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. They asked them, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son, and then he was born blind. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. Ask him. He's old enough to speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, God should get the glory for this because we know this man Jesus is a sinner. I don't know whether he is a sinner, the man replied. But I know this, I was blind, and now I can see. But what did he do, they asked. How did he heal you? Look, the man explained. I told you once, didn't you listen? Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they cursed him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. Why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. You were born a total sinner, they answered. Are you trying to teach us? And they threw him out of the synagogue. We're only going to study the first four verses of this story. Um, we're coming to the end of the series, and as we get closer, it speeds up closer to the finish line. But before we park the car on this message series, we've got to study through this story. Now, I 
I have, um, I don't know about you as you read it, I've read it several times this week. If this may be your first reading, I don't know. Maybe you've never read it before, that's fine. But for me, I've got ten things to talk about in this story. Tonight we're going to do one. I don't know how many weeks. I don't know if we're going to combine things. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But this week I just want to talk about the first four. The first, first four verses. We need to have an accurate view of Jesus. Much like the tick on the 360, if we don't have an accurate view of Jesus from the Gideon, nothing else in life works. Okay? We can have a, a wrong opinion on which team is the best. We can have a wrong opinion on what state that we live in. You know, I like this state, you like that state. We can have a wrong opinion about a lot of things. But if you have a wrong view of Jesus Christ, nothing else works. And so we have to have an accurate view of him, and I hope that we can help establish that tonight. Um, I, I would say that tonight is one of the more difficult things that, that I'll ever discuss with you. That I knew going in that it's going to be a high pressure, like a pressure cooker in here, because you're going to hear me say things that you may not agree with, but I just need you to be patient. I need you to get through it. I don't need you to agree with me. It's not up to me to decide that. Uh, but I want to ask for your grace. I want to be able to share some things that I've convicted of. If you don't agree or if you need some clarification, if you have questions or another position on this topic, Sunday night, 6.30, you come and we can talk about it. You're allowed to be wrong. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, I want to do that. I'm just kidding. I want to do this. Um, I, want to, I want to jump away from that story for a second because I need to share something with you. And this has been one of the things that I've been passionate about since day one, too. Um, and it kind of drives uh, my ministry of what I'm to do, and all of us are going to do something different uh, for Jesus and with Jesus, but this is for me, and I, you know, because I speak and I speak the Bible for a living, this is what I do, uh, this is, this, I'm passionate about this, and, and this message um, stems from this charge that God has given to the, to the preacher, okay, so this is what it says, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, it says, preach the word of God, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Okay, um, I'm not the guy who's gonna tell you what you wanna hear. I've never been that guy. And that may be why every single seat in this church is not full. Maybe that's why we don't have multiple services with people flowing up out of the doors and they're not filling up. Because I tell you the truth of scripture, I tell you the whole thing. And that's what happens when you choose to be obedient to the word of God and just go through books. You start hitting topics that sometimes you don't wanna tell people because everyone wants to hear about the love and the grace and the mercy and the favor and pour down your blessing on me, Lord, because I tithe. Okay, well, that's just one thing. That's one facet of the gospel, but not all of it. So I've been charged to tell the full counsel of God, and so that's what I'm going to do. And so when you read a text like this here in John chapter 9, it starts, you start questioning, like, where's this nice God at? Where's the nice God? Well, I'd say he's really, really nice. I'd say that this guy, born blind, Think about that for a second. Think of your yourself, if you will, if you were born blind. If you were born blind, and all the pain and the suffering and the struggle that goes along with that, would you say that it's good? Probably not. I don't think too many people would say that that's good. We all have aches and pains. We all have a cross to bear. We all have stuff that we deal with. But how many of us have been born blind? Not too many. It's not really the most popular thing, but... Here's the thing. Uh, here's the question that is asked here in John chapter 9 of Jesus, the greatest teacher. Why was this born? Why was this guy born blind? And all the negatives that come with blindness, like is it a punishment? He gives us two options. Two very popular options. Was it because you did something wrong? Did he do something wrong and he get punished by this God who's out there in heaven with a thunderbolt? Did you do something wrong and you're paying for it? Or was it his parents' fault and they did something wrong and you're paying for it? Popular opinion, especially amongst the Jews of the day. That's what they believed. They believed, all of them believed, that when you have some type of ailment like this, it's because 
your parents and your grandparents sin, a grievous sin is being passed down to the kids. And so that's the question. They come and they say, is it A or is it B? Was it you or was it them? And Jesus is like, well, don't limit me. Don't limit me. Maybe there's a C in there somewhere. And I want to offer this to you. I think there's a lot of C's. I think there's a ton of C's when it comes to the Bible. I think there's a ton of seeds, and we all hold firm to our own belief. We say, this is the way it has to be. And I would tell you that don't be so sure of yourself. See, the Bible says things, things like this that are mysterious, that the secret things of the Lord's. Because we all, we pride ourselves on knowing. We're intelligent, we're smart, we book read. We listen to preachers, we go to church, and we want to think that we know the secret things of the Lord's, right? That means there are some things you won't know. The Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind can... Who's, you know the smartest person I think I know? I think it might be Jeff. Y'all know Jeff, right? Yeah. I think he's probably the smartest guy I know. Mm -hmm. but, but the Bible says that no mind, no matter who they are, no matter how smart they are, no mind has ever even imagined what God has planned for those so we don't always know it all. So sometimes it's not just, and I hate that when people watch you with a close question, you know, is it A or is it B? And it's like you're forced to make a choice. And God's like, mm, maybe there's a C there. Maybe there's something more. Well, when I read this story, what, 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 what came up in me was it, it begs this question. Not only just why was this guy born blind, but it starts to, I don't know, it's almost like the, 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 the beginning of this very, very popular question that so many of us have. You don't have to raise your hand if you've asked this question. But it's why do bad things happen to good people? Very popular thought, very popular question. All of us, at one point in our lives, we ask that question. Why do, good, why do bad things happen to good people? So here's this blind, I mean, this guy's been born blind, right? That's why I thought this. He was born blind. So when a baby is born, I mean, who loves a baby, right? Everybody loves a baby. They're cute and godly, right? He loves Jackson. Jackson loves Paul. I like Jackson. Right? What's that? I like Jackson because it's a throw <laughs> Right? I, everybody loves a baby, right? So why would a baby be born blind? That's kind of mean, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, that's the question that came up in my mind, and I don't know if it came up in yours, but it came up in mine, so I guess we're going to talk about it. I got a microphone. Hey, guys. Here's the thing. I wish, I wish I was this, like, incredible oracle that anybody that has any specific tragedy comes up in their life, like, why did my kid have this? Why did this typhoon do that? Why did this tornado hit my house and not? Like all these tragedies, and they could come up to me and they could ask me, and I'd just pour out this wisdom that would satisfy their soul to their specific situation, right? Okay, that would be great if I or Pat or you or anyone, if we knew a guy or a gal like that, that'd be great. Okay? I think we'd all admit that. Unfortunately, I'm not that guy. And nobody's that guy. Nobody can explain these specific tragedies, like why did this kid get cancer? Why was this kid born blind? Like, I don't know. I'd like to answer that, but I just can't. But I think there's something that we can do. I think that we can discuss, you know, what's a bad thing? If we can determine what a bad thing is, and we can determine who are good people, like, there's, there's two questions that we can answer, and I think the Bible will help us do that. It'll help us to understand why bad things happen to good people, okay? Let me start by telling you this as we investigate those two things. And, and this, I'm telling you right now, if you're a Christian, if there was ever a time for you to just scream out amen or hallelujah or woo-hoo, this would be it. Okay? You don't always get what you deserve. Yeah. Right? See, see a, a lot of times we don't think of the positive aspect of that. If you embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved. Even though you don't deserve eternity and glory with Him, you get it. That, that's awesome, right? You don't deserve it, but you get it. We don't always get what we deserve, but we sometimes focus on 
on the flip side of that, and that is I deserve something good, a sense of entitlement. And so when this kind of thing that I perceive as bad happens right into my life, I'm negative about it, okay? Why do bad things happen to good people? Um, I want to read a verse to you. I think it will help you. Matthew 5, 45 says that God gives rain and sun to both the just and the unjust. But we're happy when he gives rain and sun to the just because I deserve it. But the, the person who's not living up to my standard, why is he getting the same blessing? See, that's that common grace. When the sun comes up in the morning in the east, the just and the unjust get to enjoy it. The, the just and the unjust get to eat the plants that that sun grows. We all get to enjoy it, but that kind of rubs us the wrong way, right? But why does he do that? Why do these things happen? We're, we're want to know the real Jesus here, right? I want, I want you, if there's one gift I could give, it's the real Jesus. Why, why does he give rain and sun to the just and the unjust? I'm going to bring you back a few weeks to a verse that just, it made my skin rough, probably made yours too. Psalm 115.3, our God is in heaven and he does as he pleases. See, here's the, here's the thing that well, I want to challenge you tonight. This is what, this is the greatest challenge here tonight is this, is you need to understand that this is not about you. So what we, a lot of us come to God because we want to be blessed. We want to enjoy all that he would give for us. We've got to change our perspective here tonight. We've got to think about him. His way is the way. And if he does something that you perceive as bad, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is. So I want to try to change your thinking here by sharing God's word. God said he wants to change who you are by changing the way you think. Okay? <coughs> Changing the way you think. Here's another verse for you. If one fifth Psalm 115 wasn't enough, check out Romans 9.18. Romans 9.18, similar verbiage, it says, So then God has mercy on whom he desires. You see, he's taken the authority away from you here, and he's claiming it for himself. He's in charge. He is God. And so he brings rain and sun on the just and the unjust. He does as he pleases. He gives mercy to whom he desires. Christianity is it's about Christ. It's not about Christians. And that's a mindset change that we all could use a healthy dose of. Christianity is not about Christians. It's about Christ. It's about Christ. Christianity is all about growing the church for God's glory and greater worship. That's what this is all about. Okay? It's to grow his church so more people love him, more people serve him, and their worship of him becomes bigger and louder and deeper. That's what Christianity is all about. It's all about the kingdom of heaven advancing and growing to the glory of God. That's what Christianity is all about. It's not about making life cushy for Christians. A lot of people might tell you otherwise, but it's not. So what's a bad thing? What's a bad thing? Are there situations and conditions and preferences that make me pout and cause my center is me, they make me pout? Or, let me offer this to you, are bad things only things that seem to stand in confrontation to the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. Now let me sidestep them and say God's going to blow those things down. But anything that stands against the advancement of the church, that is bad. God will win. But those are bad. Not necessarily things that come into our life that we don't like the preference. It, it interferes with the way we think. We don't like the situation, the circumstance. We don't like it. It kind of bugs us. It's in the bad column. Is that bad? I would say no. I want you to think about this for a minute. And you might not like what I'm saying, but I would say this. I want you to, to just think about this. 
Think about changing your definition of what is bad to this. Anything that stands firm against the movement of the church. Period. Period. You see, back in the text here, I think when we look at this guy that's born blind, I think all of us would agree that would kind of suck, honestly. But let's just be real. We'd all perceive that as bad. But what Christ tells us here is, oh, it's not bad. It's going to bring glory to me. So you need to change the way you think. Is it really bad? In this, in light of what Jesus says, now it's not in your world. So I understand you might just say, well, it's a little bit different. It's 2,000 years ago. It's not me. But in light of what it says, do you now understand what I'm saying? Is it bad that one must suffer that the other one, God, gets glory? See, none of us really want to suffer that he would receive glory. Nobody wants that. But that's what this text is telling us, that sometimes that's the way it is. Bad things and good people. Um, let's talk about good people. People are generally, like, who do we consider good? People that are generally nice, people that are charitable, people that are hospitable, uh, little babies and, and, and old ladies, right? Those are nice people, right? They're nice people. Okay, but let, let's, we, we, listen, if we're going to be Christians, we need to allow the Word of God to dictate the way we think. You can't stand in opposition to what the Word of God says deliberately and call yourself a Christian. You must allow it to change the way you think. And so some of us think that good people, because we have that expression, why do bad things happen to good people? So that would imply that there are some good people out there, right? What? Right? Yeah. Well, or else we wouldn't say it. Let me share with you what the Bible says. Romans 3, 10, and 12. It says this. No one is righteous. No, not even one. Uh, and then verse 12 says, No one does good, not even one. Okay. No one is righteous and no one does good. Now, does the Bible say that nobody does anything good? Well, it seems to say that, but let's just, let's, obviously, that's not what it means because we've seen good things happen. We've, we've done good things. I've done some good things, not many good things, but I've done some good things. You've done some good things. Everyone in this room, as rotten and terrible as you may be, you have done some good things. Would you agree? So Amen. the Bible's not saying that no one has done anything good, but what it's saying here is that nobody does enough good to be considered good. Connecting here? You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay. No one's done enough good to be considered good. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us in Mark 10, 18, that no one is truly good except for God. No one is good except for God. So this whole idea of why do bad things happen to good people, the Bible has just completely blown that thing out of the water just now. Okay. Nobody is good, so nothing bad can happen to a good person because nobody's good. Like, this is not church building 101 here. It's not to make you happy and want you to come back here because it's good news, but it's the truth. And I have to tell you the truth because I got one to answer to. Okay? No one is good, and this perception of what is bad, no. If it advances the kingdom of heaven, then it's not bad, it's good. Whether we like it or not, whether we enjoy the circumstance, whether we enjoy the situation that we're in, that's up to you how you react to it, but it doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that it's bad. So a man born blind Glory of God? Yes. Yes, indeed. This past Tuesday night, the men here, we, uh, we did something different. I thought it was really wonderful. We read 24 verses out loud. <laughs> Psalm 139. It was awesome. I kind of thought of we all get to be in heaven and we're around the throne and we're all just worshiping. It's cool, you know, not just one guy up here in Yapa, but a room full of men. 
read through God's Word alone. It's really cool. Psalm 139 has so much good stuff in it. One of the sections of 139 I want to kind of share with you. It's that part here in verse 13 where, 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 where David is just saying, God, you, I, I'm, I'm recognizing you're my creator. And I'm like, I, don't, I, don't, I, I never met David. You know, Bible says it's just kind of a regular dude, but I don't know. I don't know what he really looks like. I don't know what his frame is. I don't know what his body fat percentage is. I don't know. But he acknowledges his creator. He says beautifully here, and he says, verse 13, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watch me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the world. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And we take this as God's word for all of us, that, that God was the creator, that he made us the way we are. So, is it somehow that this blind guy is excluded from that? That the person who's born with this type of adversity, that, that they're excluded from God's word? That, is it possible that we are, that this guy was a wonderfully complex and marvelous blind man? Most people wouldn't think of it that way. They'd look at it as bad. But God's word says that he made us the way he made us for his glory. And that each and every one of us, whether we're tall, short, fat, thin, <coughs> ugly, well, pretty, that's the way God made us. And we're all marvelous. We're his creation. We're made in his image. Even the blind guy. Even the blind guy. Okay? So now go back to the text and look at verse 32. What does it say? Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. And you keep reading. If this man were not from God, he couldn't have done it. So here's the thing. Did he make a man blind? Did God, this God that everyone says is supposed to be really nice and loving and gracious and kind, merciful, did he make this guy blind and have to go through suffering? Imagine a life. This is a man now. This is a grown man. According to the text, he's a grown man. So years and years of not being able to see, being blind, and the suffering that goes along with that. Okay? It's hard life. Did God do this to bring glory to himself? Yes. Yes, he did. It's not some isolated incident in the scripture. Remember I said, I have to preach the word. I need you to know the truth. I want you to know your creator so you can be like him. Okay? These are not popular coffee cup stories that everyone's going to be proud of and happy and talking about you know, the, the abundant life that, that God offers you. I can't believe you might have life and have it to the full. And, you know, if you'll give, I'll pour out a blessing on you that you can't contain. Those are on bumper stickers and coffee cups. This is not, hey, you might be born blind to the glory of God. Want that on your t-shirt? Probably not going to happen. Okay, but this is the truth of who you are. I don't want you to worship something that's made up. I don't want you to worship someone that's not real, okay? And let me give you another story of this real God. It may not line up with your beliefs or your happiness. John chapter 11 is the story of Lazarus, okay? According to the scripture, him and Jesus were homies. They're tight, okay? They're buddies. He was good friends with not only Lazarus, but his, his two sisters, okay? They were good buddies. He loved this guy, okay? And this guy was sick, and Jesus was in another town, and they came and they said, hey, could you come and heal this guy? Now listen, if we're good buds, and you have something that you need, and I can help you, shouldn't I come help you? Would you all agree I should come out? We're always telling everybody that's what you should do. If, you, if you're a Christian and someone needs help, you should go help them, right? So it's, it, 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 follows, it follows the same idea that Jesus should have responded by going and helping this guy, right? Because that would be good. Jesus and him are buddies, so would you say he's probably a decent feller? He's a good guy, so why is it that 
Jesus would go, no, on purpose, I'm not going to heal him. I'm going to let him die. That is not what we perceive as good. Now, that is a perfect example of why this bad things happen to good people. So now, what Jesus is willing, okay, this man we call God, is willing to let Lazarus suffer enough and die. Like, who thinks death would be fun? It's not fun. He would allow Mary and Martha, his two buddies, Lazarus' sisters, and all their family and friends in that community to go through all of the suffering and the sorrow and the mourning of losing someone that they love. Why would he do such a thing? To bring him glory, because he's the most important. And if we suffer for his glory, it's a good thing. Nobody wants to hear that, but it's the truth. It's the truth. His death was worth it. The suffering in the people was worth it if God gets the glory. I don't see a lot of smiling faces in here tonight. I don't see it. Because this rubs us wrong, right? It's not fun. But it's true. It's very, very true. So God says yes to death. Yes to sorrow. Yes to mourning. Yes to sadness. So he can get glory, praise, and worship. It tells us that uh, in the back of the text, that back in verse 4, it says that we all have to carry out the task assigned to us by God. So we have the standard of why would bad things happen to good people. So we have a standard of what is bad. We have a standard of what we think our life should be. This is how our life should be. And if I'm a Christian, it shouldn't be here. It should be here. This is how our life should be. It's a universal thing. All of us have different, little different details, little variants to it. But we have a standard, especially depending on the culture that you're in, the, the country you live in, and even the area of the country that you live in, we have a standard of living, don't we? We have a standard of living. And if we duck below the standard of living, that's perceived as bad. If we're over the standard of living, that's perceived as good. But the Bible tells us that we all have our own race. That not everybody's the same. It says that we are we have to carry out the task assigned to us. I got a different task than you. I have a different task than you. We all have a different task. We all have a different life that God has given us. He wants to receive glory through our life and through our situations, and we all have to carry our own cross. God created a blind guy just so God could benefit. <laughs> Rubs you the wrong way, right? Nobody wants to hear this. He created a blind guy and all of the suffering that goes with it for his glory. Okay? He let a dude die on purpose just so God could benefit. Bad things in you. If, if, um, if bad things shouldn't happen to good people, I want to ask you this, okay? Who is, this is not a real word, but who's the goodest person who ever lived? Robert Newton. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. He, Jesus. Uh, right? I, listen, if, even if you're not a Christian, Christian, Christian brought up, yeah, Jesus, perfect guy, didn't sin, great, perfect, right? People that aren't even Christians, would say that Jesus was a good man. He helped people, he healed people, he gave them food when they were hungry, they were blind, he made them see. Right? He, he was a rescuer. He just did, he poured himself out for everybody. Great guy. The goodest guy that's ever lived. Amen. The goodest guy that ever lived. Come on, people. Now, um, a couple weeks ago, can you please do a favor? Chill. A couple Amen. weeks ago, Mark came up and he read, uh, before communion, he read, Isaiah 53. Do y'all remember that? 
You read Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 talks 800 years before Jesus is born in the flesh and comes into the stable and laid in the food trough. Before that, 800 years before, God gives Isaiah the words to talk about this guy who was going to come. He was going to be the Messiah. This is what he, he was going to be born like this. He's going to live like this. He's going to die like that. What it was for. You guys remember all that story? Now listen. You all, would you all agree? Show of hands. Just and you don't 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 be suffered into the crowd, okay? Don't be suffered in. But show of hands, who thinks that Jesus Christ was the goodest dude that ever lived? Okay, pretty universal. Everyone here thinks that he was the goodest dude, okay? The goodest. Okay, now listen. Look on the screen at the page number. Please go there. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. I always want you to look at the Bible, and I want you to just assume that what I'm telling you is true. Okay? Flawed man, perfect book. Amen? Amen. Okay. Okay. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life. And the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, a righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. Now, let me ask you this. Y'all said that Jesus is the goodest dude who ever lived, right? Awesome rocking guy. God's, God's good plan includes crushing him, causing him grief and anguish. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think of good plan and being crushed filled with grief and anguish, like, that they're not the same. Do, does anybody? No one would think this, right? But it's God's good, this is the goodest dude, the most perfect, righteous fellow who ever lived, but yet it's God's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Why? To the glory of God. It was okay for the best guy to go through hell so that God would receive glory, but yet sometimes, somehow we fail this entitlement that we don't have to. Why? We need to learn to know our Creator and to be like Him. He wants us all to be saved. He wants us all to also know the truth. The truth, Isaiah 53. Good plan sometimes means bad things. Why? If I must suffer, for God to receive glory, so that more people will be here worshiping Him. Amen. Amen. I'm not saying that to be righteous. I'm saying that that sometimes I don't even have a choice. I can sit here and say I'm in. It doesn't even matter what I say. If he wants to bring it to me. He's going to bring it to me because He's going to receive the glory. Jesus goes on and tells us about this. He says, "I'm going to be spit on, mocked, slapped." Stripped, spiked, stabbed, and killed. Anyone think that's a good plan? It's a really good plan. See, that's the thing. I, I baited you. I baited you. I knew you were going to say no, but listen. You've got to change the way you think. Just because you don't think it's good, that doesn't mean it's not good. It is good if it brings glory to God. Even if you don't like it, you've got to change the things that you like and dislike to get in line with what God does. Remember he said, I want to make you into a new person by changing the way you think. And we all think that being crushed and caused grief and anguish is bad, but what it's telling us here is that that sometimes is God's good plan. We have to embrace this. We have to embrace this. I'll leave you with this. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that God is a rewarder of those who sincerely seek Him. The reason why I close with that is because 
this message is not something that is popular, it is not fun, I don't see a lot of hallelujahs, I'm not feeling a lot of positive vibes coming back at me. As a matter of fact, I, feel, I see a lot of the stink eye coming at me. And no one's real happy about what I've said, except I think Cindy. She's about the only one, right? <laughs> Nobody else is happy except her. Okay? But did I, did I read scripture to you? I just want you to, I want you to, I want you to be rewarded. I, I want you to know the real God. I don't want you to get one tick off. I want you to say, dead on, set your face like stone, and pursue the real Jesus Christ. Because that is where the blessing is. And, and when I tell you stuff like this about sometimes it's, it's nasty and ugly and crushed and you know, anguish, that doesn't seem peachy and happy. It's not like, oh, I love coming to this church. It always makes me feel better. <laughs> I don't care if you feel better. You know what I care about? Like, I, listen, you know what I care about? I care about you. I care about you. And I want you to know the real Jesus. He's a rewarder of those who sincerely seek him. Seek after the real God. Okay? That's what I want to encourage you to do. Seek after the real God. Listen, I, want to, I, I painted a very ugly picture tonight. It is true. It is true. But listen, I want to share this with you too, and then, then I'm done. God loves you. God loves everyone from Kyle all the way around the room to me. He loves every single one of you. He loves you so much that he is willing to be crushed and cause grief and anguish that you might live. That's what he can do. And that's what he has for you. It's awesome. It's a reason to celebrate. It's not always happy and cheerful. Jesus said, in this life, you will have troubles. You will. But be of great joy. It's all good. Because I've conquered the world. I've overcome the world. It's all right. Say, say, take a minute and we'll pray, okay? And then the guys will give up their communion. We'll take it together as a family. Thank you for being a church, first of all, that allows me to share the truth of Scripture from cover to cover without you throwing tomatoes at me. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord God, I thank you uh, personally for these people. I thank you um, for shining light into a, a dark area of my heart. Uh, sometimes I'm guilty of it. I feel like uh, things should go really good for me because I'm a Christian now, and I'm a pastor now, and I study the Bible, and I tithe, and all this stuff that I think I'm so great, and I'm not. I'm just a regular dude. And thank you, Lord, for the fresh reminder that, that you bring rain and you bring sun to both the just and the unjust. Thank you for the reminder that you are in heaven and that your thoughts are not my thoughts and your ways are not my ways. Now, just as the heavens are above the earth, so are your thoughts and your ways higher than mine. You do as you please. And I need that reminder, Lord. All of us need that reminder sometime that, that, that you know what, God? You're the center of the universe, not us, not me. Lord, all things for your glory. It reminds me of a song, it's one of my favorite songs in all the world. It's by Mercy Me. It says, Whatever it takes to praise you, Jesus, bring the rain. I feel like I'm really cursing myself here because <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do with me. But whatever it takes to praise you, Lord, bring the rain. Lord, help us to line up our thoughts with yours. Lord, we want to know you. We want to know the truth. We want to get to know our creator well. And that's why we've all chosen to come here tonight, to get to know you better.